So here we go again then. Let's get started. Another race for the world's greatest driver, Juan Manuel Fangio. Former world champion Jim Clark leapt into the lead. That's Clark's Lotus going like a bomb. But James Hunt is the world champion by just one single point. By being a racing driver, you are under risk all the time. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. And that is Michael Schumacher ahead, the world champion. To become a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, champion of the world. And for all the kids out there who dream the impossible. Max Verstappen is champion of the world. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of F1 in Review 2023. I'm Tom Claibon, I'm back and I'm joined by Angus Gallagher and Tristan Fancourt. Today we look forward to F1 returning with the Dutch Grand Prix after the summer break. And we also look forward to the new Grand Prix calendar for next year, 2024, which will feature 24 races beginning in Bahrain on March the 2nd, finishing in Abu Dhabi on December the 8th. And upon release of this, F1 were very clear or very keen rather to make clear it's their intention to move towards greater calendar regionalization reducing logistical burdens and making the season more sustainable wow um what's your thoughts then tristan do you think it's going to be achieving at least some of these goals i do think that they've they've achieved some of their goals and one of the things that we do have to consider unfortunately is the uh, the devil in the background in this case which is money and a lot of these mm. tracks spend a lot of money to position themselves carefully in the calendar and you may for example fancy being at the very end of the calendar like Abu Dhabi and hope that there's a championship fight paid dividends 2021 not so much 2022 or 2023 Mm -hmm. but um hey it works every so often and you may want to be in the middle as well. You know, halfway through the big fight, who's going to win? And, you know, you're the last race before the, the summer break. Oh, cliffhanger. Again, not really 2023. <laughs> and you may want to be at the beginning as well because it's wide open and anyone can win. For the first couple of races last year, it was Ferrari. And wow, exciting. Everyone got excited about your particular track. And on top of that, though, you have this other fight, this other urge, which is Formula One want to try and be net zero, which is obviously very difficult in a sport that prides itself on burning fuel very very loudly so everyone was also trying to be more net zero and logistics is the biggest contribution by far to emissions and so they're trying to package everything together now they have i think to some extent managed to do that and if you look in the 2024 calendar then we start off in the middle east bahrain saudi arabia australia then we have asia over to america i mean yeah i mean that's close enough i mean when you're over in that part of the world anyway and trying to get back to either europe or america it's always going to be quite far away um and so we go to asia and then we go to europe and then we trundle our way through europe Back to Azerbaijan, back to Singapore, and then we have the Americas, um, Central America, Southern America, South America, and then we're back again to the Middle East. So yeah, pretty good. I think that's not too bad, except, except, what the hell is Canada doing between Monaco and Spain? Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't mean, know it's on planet been... Earth, isn't it? But yeah. aside from that, uh... yeah, like, I don't, I don't quite, I still don't get that one because you know Canada could well be with USA, Mexico, you know that sort of region. Even just keep it in the the Americas, that side of the world. So yeah, I find Canada a little bit weird. Um, yet again, they have not quite managed to nail it, and that is frustrating. But they're doing better, doing better than they were. What do you think? Yeah, it's a uh, the calendar is a complicated beast because, like you say, you got some things which come into factor, such as races wanting certain billing. So, a trend came in over the last maybe decade, fifteen years of races uh, in countries which politely did not have or do not have much Formula One heritage, but they want to pay top dollar. They want to have those slots at the primary points of the calendar. So places like Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, they want to sort of 
showcase their region and be the grand opening to the season. Abu Dhabi, which um, you two will have grown up in the same era as myself, where the season finale was always at Brazil. It, it, it could not have, it could not have not been at Brazil. I mean, that was the last race, and that's where the championship was decided. But then Abu Dhabi came in, paid vast sums of money, and I think I want to say it's not been since like maybe 2013, 2012 that uh, Abu Dhabi wasn't the last race. So it's been a it's been a very long time where it's held that role. You also have to take into account uh, climate and weather. For example, holding the European races outside of uh, the months of June or uh, May to August would be a bit of a mistake because of the weather and the fact that in Europe, uh, admittedly we have had this big heat wave in southern Europe this year, but other than the summer months it tends to be colder in Europe. And there's a, I was reading once about a time when they decided, I think it was back in the early 2000s, they uh, had a go at hosting the British Grand Prix on the first weekend of April and it was an absolute Ooh. unmitigated disaster Ooh. because it was wet, it was windy, um, <laughs> all the car parks and tents, uh, tent areas were flooded and they went, okay, let's not do that again. Mm. And then, of course, mm-hmm. some races in the Southern Hemisphere, it makes more sense to have them in their races in the winter conditions because, um, or in the winter months because that is their summer. So places like uh, Brazil, places like... Uh, looks up and down the calendar, or well, bonds like Australia as well. So there's a lot to take into account, and I think the the net zero point though is a big one. It's the thing which F1's really been pushing in recent years in terms of trying to get themselves to be carbon neutral by the end of this decade. I think this calendar is better in that respect, grouping together the Middle Eastern races at the start. <clears throat> grouping together Japan and China as well, which I don't, I can't remember the last time that happened. It's been a long time, but you also then have a big block of European races, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm putting Italy before Azerbaijan and then Singapore again. S- solid move, realistically. There is still a little bit to be desired, like putting Mexico and Sao Paulo in between the two races in America. Not sure personally. Um, Canada why um just, <laughs> i know why, why is it and also the other one which isn't talked about as much putting miami after uh shanghai but before imola uh, so within the space of a month they're going from china to america to italy <clears throat> to me you might as well just have a i'm sure they could advertise this as like a a big sort of like american extravaganza and have miami austin and las vegas back to back unless that would take away too much of the attention from from one another um the other factor that makes this complicated is that there are 24 races on next year's calendar which is a record correct me if i'm wrong Mm. because this year was going to be the record wasn't it 23 but then Mm -hmm. china couldn't return uh imola was cancelled because of the floods and now 24 races because we have uh we have china returning and imola still on there and um and imagine if if um geopolitical events hadn't gone their course there could have even been the possibility of the russian grand prix on the calendar this year because until until the situation developed in ukraine it was still on the calendar of course so mm-hmm. um the, the more and more races there are and also you think there's probably going to be a race in africa in the next couple of years so we're looking at 25 races and getting that canada to be pitch perfect and in the right place all the time is going to be an even more tricky logistical exercise than than ever before and I think really on the point of there being 24 races, the biggest calendar ever in Formula 1, I, th- I feel that regionalisation, grouping circuits together is really vital and essential to it being a success really because we've heard so often by be that fans or drivers or people involved in Formula 1 going, is this too much? Is this going to be possible? Is it practical? Is it reasonable really? And you put China back into that mould as well. You're thinking, well, this is one circuit returning, there'll be more to come. Will it get even higher? So the fact that they can group them together and go, look, this this makes sense. We do a lot of the Middle Eastern Grand Prix together at one point. We then go to Southeast Asia, for example. We're trying to be practical about what we're doing, not lurching all over the place from one continent to another and saying, oh, okay, you've enjoyed that Grand Prix here in Europe. Now go and fly over to Canada and have some fun and whack it back over to the Middle East when you've got a moment. 
it really is sort of, as I say, important for it to be done. But I think from an optics and a PR perspective, important as well, because if it wasn't done, then you, in my view, you'd have even more of a, a backlash or, let's say, apathy, really, to the idea of an ever-growing calendar. So it's not just an idea that makes sense on one aspect, but I think it's kind of vital as well, wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah, it's it's always going to be a really um, difficult balancing act i think there are some clear and obvious uh weird points that i i I can only imagine is that because of of money i think the miami one's a really interesting point because it's it's a it's a kind of turning into a bit of an odd race in that it's becoming more of a spectacle than it is necessarily a race more of like a show and if you wanted to know because i i wanted to know the the distance between uh, shanghai to Imola is 5,592 miles and the distance between Miami to Shanghai is 8,242 miles so we're you know that's it's we are taking obviously a, a, a significant increase um yeah in in the distance I mean that's it was an extra 50 percent or so so yeah you know these things do matter um <clears throat> and clearly though for whatever reason, Miami's locked into that position. It may well be, and I haven't checked the contract terms, so someone may actually know this. It may well be that my, Miami is is locked um, to the before the first European race because the European races have such heritage, such a following that they want to get in there quick, and they don't want to be next to the Circuit of the Americas. They want to be next to Mexico. They certainly don't want to be next to Brazil because Brazil was the big party. Remember that? That's the weird thing about Miami. I think. Is we used to, we have a big party, we have a big money show, and that's called Monaco. We accept yep. it's not a very good race, yep. but also qualifying's nuts, and everyone brings their boats. <laughs> and now they're like, ah, oh, Miami, we got we got a show too, and Las Vegas. I hope you're ready to spend your cash because Las Vegas tickets start from ten thousand dollars. They don't, but it's it's something like that. I saw um someone started calculating how much it was going to cost to stay in las vegas during the weekend of the of the las vegas grand prix and it you're starting to talk about tens of thousands of dollars Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah unsustainable isn't it really and it it begs the question really not only when it comes to the american grand prix but those further afield as well as we sort of move out of europe to some degree and also you see the european grand prix being uh, ones raising their prices for one reason or another how accessible is it because you can make something regionally better shall we say and clump together so oh okay then maybe i can go and watch this one and go to that one but if the price keeps on getting higher and higher it doesn't matter where they are really because you're more considering let's say the prices of something to watch it on f1 tv or sky versus going down and how much can you really experience of let's say the atmosphere of the weekend the race from sitting in your living room it's lovely but a completely different experience wouldn't you agree well you get it. i think you always get a better race in the living room i i mean i'm not sure if that's a controversial statement but certainly i've, I've having compared watching a race in real life to watching on tv i think it's much easier to see a race and understand a race in sitting on your sofa there's also less mud yeah mm. uh, yeah I, i'd agree with that i'd agree with that and i think it's especially like you say if if ticket if ticket prices um, increase as they do, and they end up being quite uh, quite pricey, I think that that will happen so long as you get countries who are willing to pay the money they are. Um, I wish I had some exact figures, and maybe someone can do a quick Google of this as I speak. But the having seen in the past articles about the the amounts of the premium for which countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Singapore, uh, Miami, Azerbaijan will pay to bring F1 to their their country and to their people. Um, so long as that money's there, then you're going to get people who will want who will will buy those those more expensive tickets, and it will get that bit more expensive. Um, and that as well is probably why we've got a combination of races being pushed off the calendar. I mean, for long for a long time, we've spoken about how how Spa is at risk and how adequate it is as a circuit um for the calendar but i think the, the the only reason we're looking at that adequacy in the first place is based on the fact of it's struggling to 
actually compete against these countries? Is the Belgian government going to contribute 100 million, 100 million euros a year to host an F1 race? Mm. No, realistically. Mm. Is the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund going to contribute 100, 100 million dollars a year? Absolutely it will. So you then have this situation where those races are forced out. But then also the calendar gets cramped with all these different countries that want to host a race. If you look at that calendar for next year, how many of those countries didn't host a race, say, 20 years ago? Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, China, definitely. Um, even Zandvoort. I know it's a, diff- it's a different circumstance, but still it's not a lot. Azerbaijan, Singapore, still a new race. Las Vegas, Qatar, Abu Dhabi. That's about a third to half of the calendar, which wasn't wasn't there about 20 years ago. And that's simply because of the the funds that have been introduced into F1, which has left that competition being, for, there being competition for spaces, but also forcing some others out. Some might argue if only it was like the calendar in 1950, which <laughs> yeah. I've had the, the chance to Google. You have to remind me of that one. Which is really seven know. races long. <laughs> started in May, ended in September. Um, and it had, <sighs> they, they, tra- they travelled to uh, Silverstone, Monaco, the Indianapolis 500 in late May, a uh, nice little trip across the Atlantic, and then Switzerland, Belgium, and France, and then they had a two-month <laughs> break between <laughs> races six and seven. With the, because, you know. With the season finale, <laughs> yeah, the tension, and the season finale was at Monza. There's eight so, races. Um, it was, uh, seven races. No, no, seven races all in Europe. No worries about uh, carbon neutrality. Although I doubt climate change mm. was on the agenda when they. Um, yeah, it was 1950. Climate change didn't exist back then. Yeah, is it? Yeah, well, <laughs> so that was the that was the simpler time, some might say, uh, compared to having to piece together a 24 race calendar these days. That's, that's hilarious. Mm, and I think it shows really how Eurocentric Formula One was in its infancy and how big it's become now. We're pretty much in literally every continent when it comes to having a circuit there. And I don't think that's a bad idea at all. I think the idea of taking to Formula One to every corner of the globe is, is a good idea, but it begs the question about how it's done. I think that's the problem some people have because you could talk about regionalization or Formula One do more generally, but then it's regionalization to a point, isn't it, really? It's regionalization uh, in terms of what we can afford or what we can allow owing to the amount of money put in. But um, I have actually Googled the average price of a ticket, a three-day ticket in Formula One for 2023. Do you want to have a guess at what the lowest one is? All right, so that will be scum class and behind a hedge. Hmm. This uh, is circuit, by the way. Oh, so oh, the, lowest, uh, <laughs> the lowest... Um, Let's look at the calendar. Um, I reckon what's like a family friendly. So I think it's going to be an enticement offer though for a Middle Eastern one. So, mate. So what are you going for, Angus? We're going with two different streams I'm here. So I'm thinking European, and looking down the list, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the Hungara ring. I reckon Hungary. Okay. He's bang on. Oh, oh he's bang yeah, on. Okay. 184 US dollars for a three-day average F1 ticket in Hungary. But Tristan, you were also right to a point as well, because next is Bahrain. Yes, I was going to ah. say, is it Bahrain? 265, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, there you go. I mean, I guess that makes sense, because they... Uh, well, okay, I don't understand hung, the Hungary ring one, but I guess it makes sense to me that the Bahrain is cheap too, because people want to, you know, they want to entice you to the Middle East to... Um, demonstrate that that they are also open to tourists i guess because mm-hmm. you know I'm not, i don't know about you but i'm not like where should i go on my holidays oh should i go to the usa should i go to the canary mm-hmm. islands oh bahrain <laughs> <laughs> and for those who care about the uk one silverstone that's the sixth highest so the average <laughs> oh, oh, for that really? one is 556 us dollars for a three-day average f1 ticket whoa but that is hold on is that just the cheapest though because I looked at how much it was going to to be to go in, um, and it was like, you know three hundred and sixty something quid uh, pounds, I should say, if you're not familiar mm. with our uh, colloquialistic language for pounds, um, uh, three hundred and sixty pounds, and it was going to, and that is to me outrageous, given the last race I went to was Hockenheim, and it was about seventy five euro for the three day ticket. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um. Yeah. All I'm saying here is average three days. So I'm guessing. 
that and the difference in, the difference in currency is maybe the difference of 2023 but no i i can but say thank you to f1destinations.com yeah the name of the website which i hope is actually factual um <laughs> <laughs> uh, fact checking does exist at f1 <laughs> would you like to hear some of the observations i have for um this calendar though because there are some changes which you may have not picked up on for, for this upcoming 2024 calendar um very quickly so it's interesting that you said, Tom, about accommodation for different audiences. Well, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia are going to be Saturday races to mm, respect wow. um, Ramadan. So I, I haven't experienced a Saturday race. Uh, I'm sure there may have been one, but I don't remember the last one. So that's going to be quite exciting. Um, Japan is now round four in April as opposed to the end of the season. Uh, Baku's round 17 in September. China's back, so place your bets now on whether or not it will actually go ahead. I think it probably will, given they've now relaxed their COVID rules. Uh, Qatar is the penultimate race that's changed. Uh, a month's gap between Singapore and Texas. There we go. We were laughing at them like, ha ha, you're having a two month hmm. gap before you last race. Well, there you go. <laughs> a month's gap between Singapore and Texas. Summer hmm. break part two, F1 Boogaloo. And then we've got three yeah. triple headers, Spain, Austria, UK. Texas, Mexico, Brazil, and Las Vegas, Qatar, Abu Dhabi. Um, hmm. Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious me! Well, that's going to be quite a, a a lot, isn't it? Those that Texas, Mexico, Brazil, Las Vegas, Qatar, Abu Dhabi. Um, so we've got we're going to have really going to have our work cut out to cover that. Most definitely. And in terms of Formula One this season, though, it's returning this weekend, as hinted at before. The summer break's rolling up, but the rumour mill is gathering pace, really. There's a handful of drivers yet to confirm where they'll be next year. So without any further ado, let's play another game, this one being Keep or Drop. So I'll read out a driver's name, and you need to tell me uh, whether this team should indeed keep or drop them. Is that all good with you guys? Yeah. Yeah. It's like team keepy uppies. For, for, ne- for next okay, season. Cool. For next so, season, this is. Indeed. indeed. As not, yeah, as in the, the race for this this season and then their future being keep or drop. So it's cool. like drive or survive. Sort of yeah, sure, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we mention but... more popular shows, it increases <laughs> engagement. <laughs> it pings off with the AI. Um, right, so Yuki Sonoda, should Alpha Tauri keep or drop him? keep because he still is learning and young and also he's shown enough this year to show that he's made improvement and he's driven some more solid races and it shouldn't reflect on him the fact that Daniel Ricciardo has now come back into the team and also because and I feel like I've been saying this for about 10 years now but there isn't enough options in the Red Bull Driver Academy below him and yes I feel like I've been saying that for a long time but almost by a stay of execution and uh, not needing to be dropped. He um, he sticks around for me. Yeah, that's a, that's pretty compelling, isn't it? Um, that there's no one else <laughs> around. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure that's the primary reason I keep Yuki Snowdeer, but it's certainly a, a the factor, I think, that really cements him there. And uh, he's rooted there because I think he should be kept. And that's because I think he is developing quite nicely. I think he did really well in Spa to to demonstrate why he deserved that seat. And uh, his fight between, I'm talking about his fight between the the Williams, which was labelled the rocket ship by many Mm -hmm. uh, British F1 commentators before before their performance fell off a cliff. But uh, Yuki Sonoda had a great fight with him and actually continued to demonstrate in in that situation why he has been... Um, slightly improving and why you should keep the seat. So yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think there's anyone else to, to pick it up. And I really want to see Sonoda continue to progress given that he came into the sport with a massive fanfare behind him. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think they should keep him. He's improving and Alpha Tauri needs stability really after what has been a rather unstable period. And I think that if Sonoda plays his cards right and slowly does improve and continue in this sort of hopeful trajectory, if he sticks around you know, for a while, he could be the ultimate successor to Perez, in my view. Not because he's sensational, but because he's the dependable man. So, for that reason, I think they should keep him. Uh, going on to the next one, then, Zhou Guang Yu. I'd personally drop him. They won't because of the funding behind him and the Chinese market that opens up. But on the track, if we're looking just at that, I don't think he's living up to the potential, personally. Mm, keep because there's not many options in the academy. I don't know. Um, it depends. 
depends on these rumours about whether Carlos Sainz is going to join Audi, which of course it's not yet Audi, it's Alfa Romeo, but it's uh, not too far away, the shift to or the shift in team name, the change in team name. And if Carlos Sainz would I'm not saying he's joining next year, but if he were if he was to join in the imminent future, I think it's quite clear that Joe would be the one to go and Bottas would probably stay simply for the experience. I think that Audi would want two experienced drivers in their initial foray into the sport. But for now, I guess in terms of lack of options, there's Teo Porcher in Formula 2 who's yeah. done quite well and he's still young and he's in, he might win the, cha- the F2 Championship uh, this year. I mean, this is his third year in F2, but he's only he's only 20 years old. So... Um, He's clearly he's 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 if he was twenty four you'd think okay he's done he's done it for a few years but he hasn't taken his chance but he's clearly he's been in that championship from the age of what seventeen so he's uh, he's done well for that age so maybe him but I say give Joe the benefit the doubt again and like you say Tom the um the funding's a bit of factor because if you've got uh, backing from uh, China to fund your Formula 1 team and that is not an easy thing to let go of it's what got him it's what got him the seat in the first place arguably because it was either him or uh, Oscar Piastri wasn't it back in 2022 who were the, the mm-hmm. contenders for the seat yeah and they accidentally announced it I don't remember there was a whole load of Alfa Romeo garages and, uh, and dealerships in, in China that sort of rolled out the hey look Guan Yu Zhou Zhou Guan Yu is going to be joining us and then uh, they went shh that's that's embargoed still. Oh no! We might... <laughs> oh well, we will announce it now. Um, yeah, gotta love F one politics. Um, yeah, I I am a bit on the offence with Joe. I guess I would also keep him around. It was interesting what you said, Angus, about um Bottas being there till twenty twenty six. I'm not totally sure because that's a long way off, and at the moment, um, Bottas seems to be, I guess, the, the middling. I reckon I, flat, I would, yeah, yeah, I say he's in his um Raikkonen stage of life. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but whether well, he's gonna yeah. stay around as long as Raikkonen is another matter. So I, I'm not totally sure. I think they actually might have a situation where Bottas leaves before then. So um there might be a seat open, which would leave them needing someone who has some experience within the team. And Shogun Yu certainly could add that. And the <laughs> Audi has uh, announced their F1 and en- uh, their um, F1 uh, collaboration in China, and so clearly they have ties in that region. And Zhou Guanyu is, as a Chinese driver, an excellent pairing for that. So I think I would keep him because he seems to be relatively solid. Keeps his, he does keep his head down, I think, and does, opens yeah. up a significant portion in the market. And also, I'd like him to get have uh, the experience of a of a home race. So off we go to China next year and keep him around for that. Uh, the penultimate one then, Logan Sargent of Williams. Should they keep or drop him? Drop. I uh, I know. I was thinking about Sargent, and I knew this was coming up. And I've been, I I don't know. I haven't been massively impressed with with Logan Sargent. Um, I think he's been fine, but he's just not hes not pushing the boat out like we've seen Alex Albon do. And, okay, yes, he has had a moment of, of or a couple of moments where he's been pretty close to the point. So in Britain um, and Silverstone, he, was, he got 11th. And in Bahrain, he came out really, oh, well, guns blazing with 12th. But the, the rest of the season doesn't really lie. And he's been significantly behind where he should be. Bear, bear in mind, Albon has eleven points. If mm. he was at, if he was um, matching Alex Albon's pace, then Williams would be uh, well clear of Haas, and currently they're only tied. And I think Williams needs to up their uh, should we say that up their bar on what they want from the drivers. And it's really nice to have young gun talent, but they've got this wrong a number of times now. And I think what they were trying to do with Logan Sargent is replace George Russell. And what I mean by that is not necessarily um, get a young driver in, but get a, 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 you know, someone who could really exploit the pace. Um, and I think in reality, they've missed the mark with Sargent and they, they've 
they need to sort of reevaluate what the team's doing. I think what I would like from Williams is them to keep Alex Albon and keep that development. And then in, a, in an ideal world, they would get a really experienced, decent driver. It's one of the things I've really respected Aston Martin for doing with um, both Vettel and um, Fernando Alonso. Although they've paired them both <laughs> with Lance Stroll. <laughs> It's uh, it doesn't hmm. detract from the overall recipe. A young, really fast driver, a banker driver like Alex Albon at the moment he is, and then also a really experienced one to keep pushing the pace forward. I mean, it's shame Kibitza when he was there wasn't able to do that because Kibitza, if you don't realise, was a def was a, a world champion in the making before his incredibly unfortunate accident. And so I would like in in you know I'm just gonna tell you a dream at the moment. I have like hmm. a, a wonderful dream of. Of like Lewis Hamilton being like, oh, I'm stepping down from Mercedes, and I'm gonna go to McLaren. But if they can't do that, then Williams, because I feel like that would push the team forward, and it will get to a point I think when Mercedes is looking for someone else to replace Hamilton, or you know another opportunity comes up like that where a team's dropping their experienced, brilliantly experienced, incredible older driver, and someone's gonna pick that up. So if I was with, if I was Williams, I would be actually scouting within as opposed to in formula two and you might say well doesn't that scupper their chances of picking up a major talent like lando norris max verstappen or even you know back in the day lewis hamilton fernando alonso or sebastian vettel and i say well that's true but what you've got to remember is those sort of talents are only attracted to the 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 fast teams and so you have to get back to that point you have to get back to the point where you can attract that young talent the properly good young talent so uh, Logan Sargent, I would say I would be on the edge of dropping because I think they should be starting to scout for a, for someone within the, the um, current F1 paddock that would be able to match Albon's pace. Uh, I'm torn on this one. I, I think <laughs> for the for the third occasion, I'm going to say keep just because the options <laughs> the options below aren't necessarily great. But my point being, it depends on if I mean if you're Williams. Do you see for if you're Williams and you work in that team, you might say you might see next season as a fantastic opportunity because if they continue their positive momentum and their car is stronger, it could go either one of two ways possibly. They could close the gap on say Alpine and end up in the being a battle for sixth, or they could do what Aston Martin have done, find a little loophole and make a big leap leap up. And who knows, Williams could be in the you know the top four or five teams that might have seemed very out there at the moment but it's not impossible because Aston Martin have done it and at that stage you're thinking do we want a solid second driver to take advantage of that is that what they're thinking or are they happy to go right Logan Sargent we'll stick with him for another year develop him you know second season should be better as I mentioned last week when we were talking about Piastri these new rookies Pre-season testing only lasts three days now. So your, your, your rookie who's coming in basically has one and a half days if you split the driving equally to get used to the car before they're thrown into it in the first race. And it's a case of if you think the options are better below. So the test driver at the moment, Mick Schumacher, depends whether you as a team principal think is Mick Schumacher better than Logan Sargent as an option. Oh, definitely, I think. There's also... Mm. You reckon? I 100%. think that it's... It's a tough it's a tough one because Schumacher had those two years and he didn't show loads whilst he was in the car, but then there is an argument for he'd have spent a year out with Mercedes, he may well come back a better sports person because he's spent a year in that environment and le- and done some learning. And the other option I suppose is is the the guy who's second in the F two championship at the moment, Frederick Vesti, who's a Mercedes junior driver, uh like Schumacher. And they, Mercedes may want to plant him in that team to see how he gets on. So I'd say for me, probably benefit the doubt job in that you keep him, but with a with a view to looking towards the future after that. Um, because if you're Williams and you come up with a barnstorming car next year, you don't want to then be re- regretting it because you put the wrong driver in at the wrong time. I would probably keep him as well because he's made a solid start, best in the Latifi, granted... The bar was very much in the dirt on its way to hell in terms of quality when it came to that and what he had to do. Um, But I think as well, he 
deserves another year because by his own admission he's still learning circuits some of the some of those he hasn't actually been to for example or raced up before so I think that he is perhaps not doing better than expected but probably doing as we would expect from somebody who's not as well versed in in that really so one more year and then judgment day we like give him a if I was Williams I'd give him a rolling contract of one year and then you sit down at the end of the year and go do we want to go and do this again type thing? But um, anything more is a gamble. I do agree. Because there are better drivers out there, be that internally in Formula 1 or indeed in FT. But as we say so many times, often the best drivers don't necessarily get the seats they want or indeed any seat at all. Um, last but not least, then let's go for the Haas drivers of Hulkenberg and Magnussen. I personally would keep them both because I think Haas needs some stability after... A period of uncertainty and to be honest they cast their die didn't they really by getting rid of a young driver and getting two older ones in so I think it would go against that really to go let's get the old drivers out or at least one of them and get another young talent in really I, I still think McSchumacher was hard done by really and um, I think has to box themselves in for good or for real yeah keep them both they're all they're they slipped back a bit this year but Generally, they're on the up. They've got this new sponsor, MoneyGram, who's brought in quite a load of cash. And I think you've got two solid, stable drivers there who could keep a, a modicum of consistency for at least a couple of years because they are a little bit old. But then, you know, that's uh, it's the question of whether you want experience or, or age. And they've clearly gone with with the experience side. And I think it's a good decision for them at the moment. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And what was interesting is um, in the summer break, Formula One published some comparison stats between them. And I think that highlighted to me the difference between the media portrayal of Hulkenberg versus Magnussen versus the reality of Hulkenberg versus Magnussen. And if you look through that, you'll find that actually they have been quite similar. And they're, I mean, there are one or two uh underlying differences for example the highest qualifying place for Magnussen is third versus ninth for Hulkenberg but that was kind of a fluke because of the weather um but they've they've both um you know done very well to finish in the points um Magnussen's finished twice in the points whereas uh Hulkenberg's only finished once but that was seventh so he's got more points overall um and so there are those interesting quirks to the actual statistics but fundamentally they are uh, they're both doing very very well um and i think that's important to mention that you should actually look into how well they're doing off, off your own back and not necessarily just believe what you know <laughs> whatever the the particular story is decided to um portray because these things really matter so i think has have got two decent drivers I don't. I do wonder how long um, Magnussen's going to stay in the sport, though, because he seems to, I think, have in his interviews become a little more sedate, and I, I'm not seeing some of the passion that was there last year when he rocked up to Haas after uh, you know being out of the sport and then being thrown into that car and then helping propel that team forward. I'm not seeing that so much. But that might just be because he settled into it again. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily the uh, uh, Fox smash days of Kevin Magnussen, um, but it's not quite the excited, happy Magnussen of last year. But so I do wonder how long he's going to stay in there. But yeah, I keep I'd keep both drivers. I think they've got a solid lineup um, and they will certainly have their eye on Williams at the moment, try and get an extra point to get ahead in the drive in the constructor standings. Mm hmm. And what better place to do that than the Dutch Grand Prix coming up? As teased many times this episode, that's the next one coming up in the calendar after the big break. Now, since its return, you'll be unsurprised to hear that Verstappen has been the only driver to win there, indeed his home race. But aside from him, aside from Red Bull, who will no doubt win this one unless there's some quirk of fate, who are you keeping a watchful eye on this weekend for the right or wrong reasons? Let's go for Angus. McLaren. Much discussed in recent weeks um, in terms of can they keep up their momentum after I said after Silverstone they may struggle in Hungary because it would be a different type of circuit compared to what they had faced before. I was very much proven wrong because they absolutely aced it at Hungary as well. 
But then at Belgium, they came unstuck a little bit on the race day when, well, Piastri had his instant, but that's kind of a, form- a formality in terms of, or a bit of a an anomaly, sorry, when looking at looking at that. But for Lando Norris, he had a bit of a struggle on that that uh, that period of the race where there was long straights. He was trying to trying to get some overtakes done. It was a bit of a struggle, and you'd think that they'd be able to get their momentum back in the Netherlands because the car does look good. It's it's uh, competing well. I don't think there'll be a match for Red Bull, but I think there's an argument which I get on board with as to the fact that they could be the second fastest team again at Zandvoort due to the, the characteristics of the circuit. We had an interesting debate last week, Tom, which actually I wouldn't mind getting your your thoughts on because Tristan Tristan said to me he thinks that it's, it's feasible uh, that by the end of the season McLaren could catch and overtake Aston Martin, which, fair enough, based on the current rate of points they have accumulated in recent times, is a possibility. Uh, but I was of the opinion that, sure, they would catch or they would close in a bit, but that it would be a step too far. What do you what do you reckon? It's currently at 93 points, the gap. I think, yeah. I think when we look at what can be achieved and what is happening at the moment when it comes to the trend of performance, then definitely McLaren were in the ascendancy. I think there's no question they wanted the summer break never to, to come and be postponed forever. Meanwhile, Aston Martin have perhaps come on too strongly to start with and now we're sort of peeling off. They very much were, and still are in my view, a team that's um, solely dependent on one driver and the other one can do well occasionally. Compare that now with McLaren where you've got both drivers firing on all cylinders. You've got Piastri and Norris you know, arguably being as good as one another and there being a debate I remember you two had last week about who was better. So in that aspect, you've got the better, the better drivers or the better duo. You've got a constructor as well that's going to have opportunities when it comes to circuits like Singapore, Japan, in my view, Abu Dhabi, the finale as well. Perhaps not in the Netherlands, though. I think they're going to struggle there owing to how they've done historically. So it is possible. I don't... Hmm, it's a big gap. I think Ferrari are more likely to do it than they are. But I think you could see McLaren rising to fourth. And Aston Martin could go down to fifth. How about that? Well, I agree. And uh, yeah, my friend. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very hopeful for them this weekend. And it's so great because I've been seeing on, on Facebook all the, and, and Twitter, well, I should say X as it is now, um, all the pictures from last year and all those people there in bright orange, you know, McLaren fans through and through. It's always nice to see the uh, papaya out in force for Zandervoort and the orange flags and flares although i think they're clamping down on flares so um yeah and i i'd be sarcastic of course they're max Verstappen fans before i hmm. someone will comment being like ah oh, no they're not mclaren fans <laughs> oh, <sad. laughs> um but uh, <laughs> i think that we should be watching mclaren this weekend uh because i think they have the opportunity again to to take another big step forward this is going to be a fast track right they Zandervoort is known as a very fast track and their corners are banked which is excellent proper old school style um, bank track and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the name of the banked corners <laughs> because I respect your language too much um, <laughs> so but just know there are a couple of bank corners and that does give us an opportunity to see different approaches into the into those particular um, sections of the track. So it's got a really, really, really long DRS zone, which extends from basically ha- um, halfway through between turns 13 and 14 and then all the way there down the, the longest straight. Uh, trust me, it's very long and it's a very, very fast track. So, of course, I think Red Bull's going to be uh, up there. But, you know, for me, I think this is a, a really exciting opportunity to see what uh, McLaren can do now that they're, you know, holding on in the second half of the... Um, half of the season to their early momentum and I'm also interested to see what Williams can do as well because we know that their car favours the, the high speed sections so um, I'm, I'm hoping they can use the bank track um, to their advantage because it means you can take the corners faster and therefore they won't have to rely on their downforce which we know isn't necessarily as optimised as some of the other, other um, teams what I wanted to ask you, though, 
was I saw a really interesting comment uh, um, from uh, Christian Horner, or maybe me and Helmut Marco, so apologies if I got that one wrong. And that was a comment in relation to how good the Red Bull car was. And he said, I think the Red Bull is not an amazing car. It's only medium, very good. And I thought, well, that's an absurd comment. Until I thought about it for a, for a bit longer. And it occurred to me that maybe he's not necessarily wrong, given how fast other um, teams have caught up with only a couple of upgrades. So, for example, McLaren have taken a gigantic step forward in only one set of upgrades, whereas it took everyone else years to catch up to Mercedes. So I wanted to maybe finally find out what you thought about that and whether or not you think that's going to be proved right or wrong as we head into the latter half of this season. I think it's absolutely absurd, Tristan, to borrow a phrase. Um, (laughs) I think that to suggest that Red Bull is not clear of the field... Um, and sure, there is the there is the the max factor, and he is clearly absolutely on it right now, and he's clearly streets ahead of everyone in terms of si- uh, being in sync with with uh, with everything, being at one with track, car, and environment. So I think it's absolutely absurd that they c- you could suggest that it's a it's a it's an average car. It sounds like Christ- it sounds like a Christian Horner thing to say that. It sounds like the kind of thing Christian Horner would say to try and play down how his team's doing when in reality they are absolutely bossing it because I think that that car is still still far ahead and I know that teams have, have got better but I'm I'm not convinced by whatever what I'm not convinced by whatever whoever is saying there uh, I'm unsure myself because I think that Red Bull have done very well in terms of the regulations and what they're allowed to do but I think that it's not impossible really for Mercedes and Ferrari to miss something that's so obvious again so my answer to the question would probably be i think mclaren have found the secret when it comes to certain circuits and they've exploited that to their advantage but still they weren't able to beat red bull so i think what what christian horner what helmet marco or what what red bull is trying to say is that they're not invincible they're not impenetrable if you will they do have flaws they do have weaknesses and i think mclaren have shown that to a point but until somebody converts that that i do think those comments are are far-fetched and designed to deflect onto her his rivals and those who he's trying to sort of stir the pot with i.e mercedes ferrari mclaren and the rest really but it uh, will be interesting to see if other teams can find this uh, this issue and can go and convert their cars to go and make it as good as the Red Bull because I do think come the end it's going to be a lot tighter than it is at the moment but they do look rather undefeatable currently at least at the end of the summer or at least at the end of part one should I say of the season I just I just think it was an interesting point because I know we are all and perhaps this is the optimist optimist in me but all thinking oh this is horrendous watching Red Bulls be so good Mm. but it does kind of have the double diffuser feel about it whereby Braun came out of the gates in 2009 absolutely storming with an exploitation and Jensen Button racked up enough points in the first (laughs) half of the season and then by the end of it, he only just won the championship. Now, I don't think that's going to happen in this case, but I wouldn't say the Braun was an incredible, amazing car. It was the first to exploit something but I, it's not up there in my mind with the sheer brilliance of the Mercedes years, no. as I think we're now going to call them, in that sort of mid-teens, um, 16, 17, 18, 19, you know, and how good it was. I think that's another level. Agreed. And perhaps that's what Red Bull is saying. Or perhaps Christian Horner just wants to say, ha, our cars are only medium good. <laughs> so what are they? <laughs> Oh God, how have we won every single race of the year? Teehee, I hate it when that happens. Uh, <laughs> uh, that sort of fail. Tee. <laughs> Oops, not again. <laughs> not another win. But, Butterfingers, there goes another trophy. <laughs> based uh, on based on that that winning every race this year, you you hinted to it earlier, Tom, when you said you thought on you said on the record they win every race. Um, 
let's get a, I guess a little prediction I suppose Tristan what do you think are they winning every race for the, this year they're going to sweep sweep the lot no I think they're going to get the same as um, uh, McLaren in terms of that particular record which is uh, all but one mm. of the uh, of the races um, but I must admit <laughs> That is only because I don't think I can bear to say that a season's going to just be completely dominated and every race can be won by a single constructor. The law of yeah, the law of averages dictates that surely there's got to be one race where something, some some mechanical part explodes or some big puddle causes someone to crash. This, this statistically has to happen at some point. Now, where have I heard that before? Please. eh? few episodes ago yeah. i think <laughs> uh, <laughs> i think is i've just fully accepted now that red bull are probably going to do it and i'd like to see them do it in a strange sort of quirky way because i realize that next season fingers crossed will be far more competitive so maybe i've just accepted what is or maybe not accepted but you know come to terms come to peace with the group that is red bull being so good if it makes you feel any better it's predicted to rain this weekend Mm. So Ooh. maybe, maybe that will help. If not, we'll just send Latifi back on. Hmm. Oh yes, the great destroyer. <laughs> 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 oh dear. Um, yeah. In terms of who I'll be watching, I'll keep it short because I realise it'll soon be out of time. Uh, Ferrari, I think them versus Aston Martin to carry on the conversation from last week is going to be an interesting one. Looking at how they've done at power circuits in. Uh, races gone Austria for example they look pretty handy and then the flip side sticking with Ferrari to a point we've hinted at them this episode Alfa Romeo have been an awful season so far and I think if they don't improve this weekend and moving forwards very very soon they could finish last I think there's a serious battle for the wooden spoon for the first time in a, in a while and on that short, snappy and Ferrari-filled summary from me there, that's all we've got time for in terms of episode 25 of F1 in Review. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end of this one, be that on your preferred podcast provider or indeed elsewhere. A reminder, you can follow us on X, Twitter uh, and TikTok as well, the handle being F1 in Review. And as mentioned in pretty much every single segue and link, Formula One is back this weekend. We are going to the Dutch Grand Prix to Zandvoort uh, on Saturday. If you're watching, listening, or indeed observing and keeping abreast of all information, it's 2 p.m. That's qualifying. And same for the race, 2 p.m. on Sunday uh, is when that's going to be happening. Once again, British summertime, if you're going to be following it in the UK. And we will, of course, be back to go and review some actual Grand Prix action for the first time in seemingly years and give our thoughts, really, on what's been going on, what's good, what's bad, and what's to be revealed in weeks coming forward. So thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next week.